Hey everybody, this is Adam Shartoff, your host of Film Wax Radio, and you're listening to episode number 409. I hope uh, this uh, episode finds you well. A good episode here, we're all ready to go. I wanted to mention beforehand, though, that momentarily I'm going to be heading out to BAM to a press screening, you know, before films come out. You know, people from the media like myself are invited to see advanced screenings, and we call them press and industry screenings or some sort of thing. And coming up uh, from June 14th through the 25th is a BAM Cinema Fest. I usually talk about it every year on the show because it's a great showcase of the best of indie films from the past year. A lot of them are called from Sundance and South by Southwest and a few other festivals, or they're just cherry-picked. You know, they're just these uh, outliers that just are really special and showed up. And BAM, with their wonderful programming, and BAM, with their wonderful programming um, puts together this great lineup every year. And this year... 2017 is no different. So I'm very excited because actually the press screenings, I, I skipped the first one because I'm just too busy trying to get the show up. Uh, and then the second press screening is something I've seen, which is Alex Ross Perry's Golden Exits. But I'm going to see a doc, uh, see a film today called Bitch. So among the uh, films that I plan to see or have seen at uh, BAM Cinema Fest is uh, Landline. Which has a, what a slate! I mean, what a what a cast it has Jenny Slate, John Turturro, and E. Falco, and this is of course Gillian Robespierre's uh, follow up to Obvious Child. So I'm looking forward to that. I also plan to see uh, Ghost Story. I'm going to see. In fact, I'm seeing that today. Uh, as I mentioned, that is uh, the new David Lowry film. David's been on this show before. Actually, uh, I should mention. So it's Gillian Robespierre. She came on. Uh, to a live thing I did a couple of years ago after uh, Obvious Child. Um, and uh, another film I just saw, the documentary called The Force by Peter Nix, and we're hoping to bring Peter on. I'm pretty sure that will, will happen. Today I'm also seeing Dina, which I'm very excited about. It's won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. In, uh, it's a documentary. Uh, the Big Sick, which is the uh, new Michael Showalter. I, I think I'm getting Michael on the podcast it looks like uh, I can recommend Lemon, which is a very entertaining film. I saw it at uh, the Maryland Film Festival. So if you can, go to the BAM, BAM website, look up BAM Cinema Fest. It runs from 14th through the 25th of June. You'll want to, if you're local in New York or Brooklyn, you'll definitely want to check it out and try to get to a few of those events. They, they do a great uh, film festival. So on this episode, 409, we're going to get into a conversation with the team behind One October. The director is Rachel Schumann. And uh, the host, if you will, who guides you in the navigation through the film is Clay Pigeon, who is a radio talk show host at WFMU. He interviews people off the street. One October takes place, I think, just days before Barack Obama's first election, As since it's in October. It takes place in t October 2008, this documentary, just days before the election. And, and it's what they, where the city was at, because he walks around New York City Clay interviewing people on the street. It's that simple, but it's really compelling. I saw it at the Stranger Than Fiction uh, series, but it's going to be at the Lighthouse International Film Festival at, at LBI, Long Beach Island in New Jersey, which I'm actually trying to get to. I'm working on my all the details to get down and check out this festival, but it will be playing at Saturday, June 10th at 11 o'clock a.m., the Lighthouse International Film Festival, if indeed you are from that area of New Jersey. Check it out. I think I heard that it was going to be at the Cape Cod Film Festival as well coming up, and then no doubt many other places to see the film soon. So we're going to be talking to Rachel Schumann, the director, and we'll be talking to Clay Pigeon himself, which I'm very excited to play for you. And then the second segment, which we'll get to in a minute, I'll describe more, is Big Sonia, which is a documentary I saw last fall at, uh, at uh, Doc NYC. you got to see it. And you'll certainly have your opportunities shortly. We're going to have on the, the filmmaking team of Leah Warshawski and Todd Soliday, who uh, together have made a wonderful documentary called Big Sonia. Standing tall at four foot eight inches, Sonia Warshawski is a tiny woman with a huge personality, diva, business owner, and Holocaust survivor. Sonia has just been served an eviction notice for her tailoring business at the last and most popular shop of a dying mall in suburban Kansas City. you got to see the documentary. And and Sonia is so entertaining. Uh, Rosie O'Donnell says, Such a beautiful documentary and an unexpected and vital exploration in a time where we need it most. I love Sonia. 
Rosie O'Donnell says. And then we'll be talking a little bit more about it and the women and their fundraising campaign that they're in the midst of. And we're going to have on the women behind this new platform called Women You Should Fund. They're going to come on as well. So we're going to have a quite a robust show coming up in just a minute. First, though, let me tell you a little bit about my friends at Magic Drop. Magic Drop is a music licensing business based in Brooklyn, New York, which represents an eclectic roster of bands and composers licensing their music for use in films, TV, and beyond. Magic Drop works directly with clients to find songs or instrumentals from a catalog of a thousand plus tracks by artists with distinctive developed voices. Magic Drop offers competitive rates and festival licenses for independent filmmakers. Visit magicdropmusic.com or email contact at magicdropmusic.com for more information. Again, that's Magic Drop. I welcome them to the podcast. Okay, but let's first get into my conversation with Clay Pigeon and uh, Rachel Schumann regarding their new documentary. It's called One October, and here we go. What do you think are the most significant changes you've seen here in, in recent years? Is it as good as it used to be? Okay. It's different. It's different. Okay, that's opening a can of worms. Yeah. Because it's to pre me, and post Julian. To me, it's um, almost like it's turning into one great big mall with um, all of the stores that you see everywhere. And we're losing such significant neighborhoods here. It breaks my heart. Um, from, you know, the Lower East Side and uh, just, you know, daily. We've, what, the Minetta, you know, just closed. We lost the beautiful Minetta Tavern here. We lost... Um, um, states, um, all state, all up, state on up on the Upper West, West Side. So places side. are just closing. Those are just a few examples. Just gentrification. Mostly. Gentrification, the mollification of the city, if you will. These kids today who live here, to them, these are the good old days. Yeah, I mean, sure. they, do you think to yeah, them it's still a so. fascinating, fantastic sure. place? Sure. Sure. Well, it's sure. a fascinating, fantastic place to me, I think, sure. to us. I mean, it's still wonderful. It's New York, but um, it's changing. Talking to Rachel Schumann, the director of One October, and and Clay Pigeon, who is your your host, your guide, I should call you, because you're interviewing New Yorkers in this documentary. Rachel uh, asked me to be in it to, to kind of do what I do on the radio, which right. is just interview people on the street. So. And you know, just so people who may not know, you have a show on WFMU, which is called The Dusty Show, with Clay Pigeon. Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's, it's, can you believe it? You have to schedule radio. So yes. what a concept! Right, right. Does the, does your show, for instance, you could could it be podcast? Is that something? It you, is podcast. It is podcast. Yeah, it's a free podcast on iTunes. Right, but you want the radio. You want the the numbers yeah, to we're, reflect, we're, right? Uh, it's important uh, for a, for a radio station to show that people are actually tuning in. It wasn't long ago uh, that the amount of people listening to FMU digitally surpassed. Those who actually listen to it on the radio, but I know for say. for the uh, head guy over there, Ken Friedman, he said, "As long as I'm in charge, we'll continue to broadcast." And it makes it much more exciting as a DJ to know you're going out old school over the. I airwaves. agree. Well, even this show started as internet radio, but the the only thing I would say they had in common is they were on a schedule. People had, would have to tune in to listen to the show in on, in actually in real time. Um. My show, since it wasn't a music show, I could podcast it as well. And then I'm thinking, what am I? Nobody's tuning into me, you know, on this pla- internet platform. They're not doing it. They would more, li- much more likely do it on the WFMU. Uh, and how long were, have you been doing the show? Wow, that's a good question. I Just talk a little closer to probably to, twelve years. Really? Okay. Oh, okay. So you moved to New York, obviously. Even yeah, I met my time. wife actually through the radio show. Uh, she wrote to me and said, my friends told me to listen to you, they, that you talk about Iowa a lot. And she's from Iowa. Oh. And we started to write back and forth and, and fell right. in love. And uh-huh. I ended up moving to uh, Manhattan from Milwaukee. So were you doing the show out of Milwaukee? Right. I started, I lived in Tampa for many years until 1998. And I did the show on uh, WMNF in mm-hmm. Tampa. Mm-hmm. A, a version of what I do now. Mm-hmm. And I moved out to L.A. for a few years, and then I moved to Milwaukee, and I continued to do the show on WMNF in Tampa and send it back to Tampa. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I got the opportunity to get on WFMU, and, and I did that and moved to New York. And But were you 
Go ahead, Rachel. You were sending tapes, though, to WFMU for a while? Yes, yes, cassettes. The show was all cassettes for the longest time, but yes. I finally entered the digital realm, mm-hmm. much to the chagrin of a lot of listeners who like the romance kind of, of, of analog. analog. Yeah. Right. They're still there. I still use components of it, too. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, I mean, there's still people out there who are, I don't know if you want to call them Luddites, but they are definitely... Yeah, abso- it's absolutely true. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't... You know, we don't have to get too deep into that, no. but I, I did realize I'm not necessarily an analog purist. I, mm-hmm. I like any uh, any uh, medium. Once I went digital, I realized that I thought it would be much faster, but it's actually much slower because the possibilities just expand that much. Interesting, There's true. infinite amount of tracks <laughs> you can use and rabbit holes you can go into. So mm-hmm. if you don't temper your own creativity, right. you have to just put a parameter on it and... Right. But I think that's, I, I don't mean to take over, but uh, no. I think that's what I, I like about it. The weekly a show is that uh, it, it forces me to let things go. Like you have to let go of your creation each week. And, and, and that is exciting in itself, that parameter of that limitation. What can I do within this time frame as opposed to having a, a, a unlimited amount of time so mm-hmm. so yeah yeah i understand uh and rachel <laughs> uh where where are you from uh i grew up outside of boston mm-hmm. but um i have i went to school in san francisco lived there for mm-hmm. six years traveled a bit but then i moved to new york in 1997 and i have been had been living in the city until about two years ago. So I was here for like 17 years. And there's proof that we are in the city. <laughs> you heard a, an impatient car just a few floors down on the street. And then is this your, this is not your first feature that you've directed, is it? It's my second. It's your second. Yeah. Okay. What was your first one? Buddy? It's called Negotiations. Okay. And it, yeah. Uh-huh. It premiered in 2005 at Tribeca. Oh, very nice. And One October is the new film. It is about, well, it's about New York. It's about New Yorkers and about New York. We were talking about the romance with analog versus digital and or a certain uh, a nostalgic romance or a, a romance with nostalgia. And I, I myself certainly feel that we haven't grown up in this city. And I could really relate to the people that, you know, Clay, you were talking to in this film uh, because what it is, is essentially is is a series of conversations that Clay has with New Yorkers in various neighborhoods. So you really hit a demogra- a broad demographic, right? And, uh, and has, has New York changed, you know? And um, I'm definitely somebody who has feels it. And so I could really relate to, you know, the subject matter. The, New York isn't the, the city I grew up in anymore. There are certainly uh, exceptions. There is moments and there are spots, but... By and large, it feels like a very, very different place. Uh, if, so it's that's a very hard, hurt, you know, it's a very painful almost because uh, I feel like in my my first time in my life in the last few years, I feel like I I could move and I wouldn't miss it, you know. Mm-hmm. And the things that keep me here at this point are, are essentially my family. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I definitely had a strong reaction to one October. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> Great. Just, to, <laughs> oh, just so you know. <laughs> Where I'm coming from, going into this situation. Did, did you grow up here? Yeah. I'm interview yes. you. I know. I'm, I'm holding back. I want to ask you. You can ask the away. It's not typical, but I mean, I'm, I'm, we're talking, you know, okay. so it's fine with me. I'll, I'll answer any questions. Uh, but yeah, I grew up in the '70s, and New York was a very, very different city. You know, I just came from Baltimore. The, just yesterday, I got back because I went to the Maryland Film Festival for the first time. But I'm, I have a family member who moved down to Baltimore and invited me anyway, and I thought, this, let me go check out the festival while I'm doing this trip. And I really got to tell you, I was just shocked. It took me 24 hours or more just to process what I was seeing, like the desperation, how bad it is there. I mean, how, how impoverished and how the film festival, but the the city festival was lovely. Great. uh, Great. Great. Cappuccino. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. No, it was a great festival. Wonderful. And I really, you know, I, within minutes of my getting there, I in, mingled with Barry Levinson and John Waters, you know. Wow. So it's pretty awesome. Two of Baltimore's sons, you know. And it, so literally, they were both just there and, and around. And um, so, but Barry Levinson has a film there. and But it is a city with, it is a city 
a city with with a lot of desperate problems. It's a level of desperation there. And it, even at the you know growing up in New York, with as rough as it was in the seventies into the eighties, it was not like what I was seeing there. But it almost on some level, if you can understand it, I felt I missed some of that roughness so much. You know, I keep hearing this is a post Giuliani New York, and and I see films from the seventies, uh, Needle Park or whatever. It right, is. Panic and, in Needle Park. And, uh, and I find myself yes. wishing, gosh, I wish I maybe could have experienced some of that New York. The first time I came here was ninety one, and it was know, still built... quite different in ninety one. Right. Oh, I yeah, mean, that that era, I was thrilled. Since then. I would be thrilled to be back in ninety one, as even as opposed to seventy. Six. I mean, you know, the New York City of Panic and Needle Park and Taxi Driver is no, not much. You know, you don't want to go back to that, right? You don't want to it, romanticize that. No, much. and yeah. you could really get in trouble yeah. walking through Times yeah. Square, even you know, in the wrong moment or something. But um, but, but it's funny when people uh, visit. You know, they like to visit you when you live in New York, uh, but that fear that. That perception is still out there. Is it? Are are we safe, you know? And you're kind of laughing. Like, it's kind of ridiculously safe. You almost wish it wasn't so safe. (laughs) Almost. Like, yeah, I would say good luck getting mugged. If you can find a spot to get mugged. uh, I got mugged once a a while ago. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. We shouldn't joke about it (laughs) because people do get mugged. But they get mugged anywhere, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, so, I mean, don't. Certainly in Baltimore, you 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 know my my experience was you should probably be much much more aware of your surroundings as you walk around than you hear. And it was a striking thing, and I I wasn't trying to again try to come up with this romantic notion of a city in such poor shape. There are people who who are suffering, you know. Mm-hmm. But New York has been bought and sold, as far as I I'm concerned, you know. And um, I it's it was sold to you know like Wall Street and the politician developers and it's gone. I mean, the New York, I know, you know, the being able to afford a place or even not afford a place, <laughs> you know, to... I, I'm tempted to interject something, but do I, maybe go. I shouldn't. No, but please I, do. I, I, this is really more about the film and I'm, I, but it, it, it does strike a very personal chord. As we're talking about New York, I thought of uh, my own little tiny, I thought of my own little tiny town in uh, Iowa, which is Audubon, between Des Moines and Omaha, population right around 2000. And even that has changed dramatically. I mean, I feel the same feelings about that place when I return. Oh, the stores are boarded up. You know, it's what, what happened to the Saturday night town I knew that was full of people. And then I'm, and to go deeper into that, I wonder how much is our own nostalgia? How much is our, our own aging out? And how much does everyone feel like the kids now look at New York and go, ah, this is, this is, that's the one they're going to remember. You know? yeah, I, I think about that a lot. I mean, in, in, pro, in the process of making the film was I, I moved here in 97, but I had, my sister was here and I had some good friends here. So in the early nineties, I was coming here a lot. So that is sort of my first experience of New York and, and one that I think back on is the impression that I had of it. But when I started making the film, I, I was really angry about what was happening. Um, and I, but in, in the process of making it and over the time of editing it, I did start to have a little more perspective of, you know, oh gosh, I fell in that trap of like, you know, it's not, it's not what like it used to be. And, and every generation says that, you know, from, right. from the next one. And you always think your time was the best time. And I'm sure there are people coming now who, who just, you know, are, are starry eyed about it um, in, a, in a way that, you know, right. I, I was then. But, um, well, one of your subjects, even in the film, was a young lady who's running over the Brooklyn Bridge. I think exactly. And, you know, uh, you captured just her place in life at that moment. I guess that's you know your talent, Clay. Um, that you know, the life all of her life is ahead of her, and you know, this is what she's this is her time. And I agree with that. I I wouldn't want to take it away, and I try not to sit around being the grumpy old guy who who right. you know. Uh, the only difference I will say is in the past, the changes that have gone on in this city, for instance, if we're going to take New York as an example, is that it, it was an organic, even gentrification, is a, you know, it was organic. It wasn't always a fair thing, but it was real, and it's always happened in cities through all time where 
the economics are, what they are, and people move from one area to another, you know, whatever the reasons are. And you see these natural things happen around the city. And But th what's happened in New York, especially in the last, let's say, 10 years, you know, and in, especially in Brooklyn, is uh, a plan mm -hmm. where politicians, you know, developers made a plan, rezone, change districting, so that way they could go into business areas and make them mixed residential business, all those things, mm -hmm. and make, you know, just make, uh, f you change the rules so you can build as high as you want. Totally. Destroy the, the skyline, block the bridges, do whatever you want to do. Yeah. You know, take the waterfronts from Williamsburg, do it, and just develop and in a matter of years. People, and of course, many people uh, are thrown out. They call whatever you want blight because... Right. Just throw money at it and call it blight, you know? Yeah. And and yeah. so neighborhoods... It's no longer like the, the Italians right. replacing the Irish, replacing the Jews. Right. You know what exactly. I mean? It Thank just, you. It's, just, right. it's no longer right. that kind of Natural, cultural... Natural yeah. right, thing right. that happens at, in cities in this country. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I agree with that. I, yeah. I mean, even, you know, even though I gained some perspective on it, I do, I do think that the corporatizing for forces are something that you can't reckon with mm -hmm. and there's a, a line that gets crossed um where the the whole ecosystem is just sort of thrown out of balance and I, I i mean it just seems like how does it survive after that point and where do you know once you know at least there was a neighborhood feel to it neighborhoods take a long time to develop in their character and maybe it just evolves into something we can't understand and, and we have our own built-in obsolescence which is you know kind of a negative way of looking at it maybe but i've always wondered that do are we like automobiles do we have our own internal obsolescence built into us whereas we i'm you know almost 60 maybe it's time i have to s start phasing out and getting out of the way for whatever's coming you know i don't know i don't have the answer but mm -hmm. but uh but i have a feeling it's all across the country maybe in new york it's more poignant because it's just such a classic city of our imagination uh, outside of how, how it really is we project onto it what we really need it to be i don't know i think you're right yeah i do uh the as i mentioned before one october is a it's a series of of conversations trying to bring it back in you know <laughs> it's great to just sit here and talk over, over bagels and coffee with you guys yes. <laughs> Well, for, let me also ask, while we're at the point where I'm reintroducing the film into the conversation, where are people going to see it? Because I want to make sure everybody knows. Yes. Uh, well, it's playing May 17th, Wednesday, May 17th at 7 p.m. Um, as part of Stranger Than Fiction at oh, the right. IFC Tom Center. Powers, Tom uh, Powers' series. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one night only. And I think and, you're squeezed in. I mean, I, as far as I can tell, J Steve James's film, Abacus, is going to be there. And then, like, in a week or two, Errol Morris's film. Yes. You know, his new film, B-Sides, is going to be there. Mm -hmm. These are two towers, <laughs> pillars of the documentary. You're I'm right honored. there among them. Uh, that's wonderful. And you're adding, you know, some much-needed feminine energy, too. Well, that's, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> to those. <laughs> uh, and, and just I'll, I'll do a plug for after Stranger Than Fiction, we're going to yes. um, the Lighthouse Film Festival in New Jersey, southern New Jersey. Oh, is um, that, what what, what Long, county is it? It's Long Beach, right? Oh. Um, Long okay. Beach, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, I know exactly where it is. Okay. Monmouth County, I think it is. Okay, I don't, I don't know the county. Yeah, my family's from there. So. Okay, it's uh, June the weekend of like June tenth. Um, we don't have an exact screening date, but it'll probably be that Saturday or Sunday. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, eventually, I assume, on in various sundry, uh, maybe places to see it online, or that's all being worked out. It's right? already been at full frame in uh, oh, so, Durham, okay. North Carolina. Sure, sure. We were full in frame. Boston a week ago. At the uh, Independent Film Festival? Right. so, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, I think a couple of months ago there was, oh, you, you, you finish this and then you wonder, will it ever be anywhere? And, uh, well, you so got, we're, you know. We're pretty pleased so far. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it's a good, we're, good we're, series of, we're on of the screening. festival run. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then hopefully there will be, I don't know what the distribution plans are in terms of watching it at home or, right. you know. No, no, yeah. it's all down the line. So, yeah. okay. And uh, now, yeah, how many interviews, because again, I want to, basically, again, Clay was doing his program. And I guess the theme was, you know, has New York, you talked to, has it, or or is it was there broader than that? Was there even a, 
a theme I know. Well, I know I... you asked a couple of people, but no, you, yeah. know, you were just asking them about themselves as in, in the city, uh, well, I suppose. I mean, I, um, the... Clay and I, we, we worked together. I mean, I mostly wanted him to just do his show um, as he would normally do it. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I did talk I to see. him sort of about what the film was about. And, and I think I did kind of tell you, like, ask people about New York. It might be something that you generally ask anyway, but I, I, I was like, try to ask everybody what their feelings about New York. Right. right, and I and uh, even even outside of that, I mean, mm-hmm. it's a uh, pretty typical for me to ask people: Are they optimistic about the future, and what are your biggest concerns about life today for you, and that kind of thing? So it tied together okay. pretty well, you know. Yeah. Um, I didn't have to go outside of my what I usually do. But this was mostly shot, or entirely shot, in two thousand and eight. Yes, entirely shot. Entirely in shot, right? In October, October of 2008, yes. yeah. right during Obama's first. Yeah, the build up to Obama. The first, I mean, it was the. the Thank you. <laughs> the first administration. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. yes. Right before he was elected. Yeah, an exciting time mm-hmm. to be uh, a New Yorker and to be an American. Right. In Watch. fact, uh, one, one uh, reviewer pointed that out that to them, uh, the, it was pain, a, a bit painful to watch that level of optimism that existed at that, at that yeah. time, and the big posters of Obama that actually said "Make America Great Again." Ironically, <laughs> yeah. well, I it, that was an, I don't yeah. think that was yeah I think that was an artist uh, who did that. I don't th- that, I don't think that was Obama's uh, campaign. But even, but just that there was there is there's a moment in the film yeah, yeah that right. uh, an artist had painted a huge billboard it's poignant that, that said, you didn't know yeah. especially. Th- when you made when you decided to use that moment that it would be uh co-opted in such a disgusting <laughs> way or in this alternative way by another candidate <laughs> who shall remain nameless absolutely um and that you know not to steer the, nope. to the, Go ahead. the interview but that is definitely not... uh something that we discussed before this film came out suddenly mm-hmm. it was a completely different thing Mm -hmm. like i think uh even a year ago we're maybe assuming hillary was going to win and right there's the obama hillary connection sort of a a continuity that would flow through and then all of a sudden the wrench is thrown in the work so it it does become a different Mm -hmm. film at that point i think yeah. Uh, so how many, so you did about at least, uh, how many interviews were in this brief? It's a brief, it's a fairly, you know, brief film. It's like just, just about an hour long. Mm-hmm. Perfect for broadcast, I might add. <laughs> just saying. Yeah, just, just saying. saying. Anyone out there? You don't have to re-edit it for broadcast. That's kind of <laughs> nice. But do you, uh, uh, how many interviews did you have to work with? I mean, cause maybe half a dozen exist in the film, I'm going to say. There's, yeah, there's nine wrong. interviews nine. In, in the film, um, and I, we I'll guess that we had it like 40 or 50 uh, recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, so how did you decide which ones would work best? Was there a, well, some sort of litmus or something? Or? The one October 2 will mm-hmm. contain the, the rest. <laughs> I see. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, no well, I, I, I was, you know, I edited the film also, and... Um, you know, there's the, just like that elusive thing that makes an interview sort of sing or, you know, yeah. they, it was tough. There were some other good ones, but it was just, um, you know, each one that I chose, I feel like you had some some uh, comment on change in general, whether it was that person's own life or their life in the city or the national sense of, of change happening in that moment. So I just feel like they each added to the conversation and... Mm-hmm trying not to be redundant with anyone and just who were the most sympathetic people who were the people you yes. could relate to the most right. so that kind of thing yeah 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 clay when you talk to people um uh they're not they don't have a heads up they don't know until you approach it's kind them. of an ambush you know yeah but it's much does... easier uh, uh when i do it on the radio i'm i'm alone Right. With literally with, with your my cell recorder. phone, I don't oh. even ha- use. Right. I have a recorder like yours, but I find I these days. I thought it was like a to, to sheave a little like digital recorder. Yeah, yeah. Digital. when I, I did the, this movie, I had the Radio Shack micro cassette, oh, right. which I used for years and years and years. In fact, a specific mm-hmm. model that has a certain high treble mm-hmm. factor, so in mm-hmm. repeated generations. You lose trouble. So if I start oh, off really trouble, by the time it makes the radio, it's just about right. Uh, 
what was the question? Oh, I was just wondering, like, yeah, your <laughs> how you approach how do you how you do approach people? Like for me, I talk. I may talk to people even similarly at times, but if they're subjects of a right. film or something, they may not be the filmmakers. But I'm, I'm so, in other words, they're not necessarily poised individual. You know, I mean, they're just regular people who are not accustomed to speaking. Right. You know, about themselves. Uh, and but I wonder, like, in one maybe the most specific or I don't want to say extreme example, but is when you approach in, you, you approached a homeless person, right? A young guy actually, right. but he was homeless and uh, and 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 he's an open. I mean, he's, he's an open book. Right. He opens up to you and very very much. But it could easily have also been some a very different experience. And I guess maybe we w may may not have necessarily seen it. The results right. of that interview, with that because you may have had. I'm sure there have been those. Yeah, I. I would say when I'm doing my radio show, I get turned down at least half of the time, mm -hmm. usually politely. And I understand, and I'll say thanks anyway, have yeah. a great night, because right. I get it. Some people, a lot of times it's just shyness. People mm -hmm. think they want to do it. Like sometimes they'll say, okay, and they start, and they're like, uh, yeah. I can't. I'm, yeah. And I'm like, They haven't given it enough thought. They, it's right. not like they're approached all the time. Right. And it, uh, a lot of times if you can get them to start, they have more to say than even they imagined. It's I don't want to say Jerry Springer, but you see how that works where having where people realize they want to get things out and I don't know yeah. why public uh, platform like that causes even more revealing responses. But uh the film crew though adds a layer of legitimacy. Like if there's a cameraman and mm -hmm. a director, then people assume okay, these this guy's not some. Well, so did that change the, let's say, the success rate of your? I think requests. I think probably Rachel. Because they now they're going to be on your show, but they were going to be, they were gonna be in an interview. Yeah, yeah, we got, we definitely got turned down. We got turned down, but I don't know your ratio of getting not that, not that much. I would say not, not that many turned downs. So if you're saying fifty percent of the time you get turned down, I would say it was definitely much less than that. But. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in recent years, I did use politics as uh, not necessarily something I initially wanted to talk about, but something that, that in general in New York mm -hmm. that was uh, an easier opening line than some some things, mm -hmm. like maybe like what's your biggest concern or your biggest fear or, you know, something personal like that. Mm -hmm. Politics was a good warm-up, mm -hmm. especially near an election because everybody sure. has an opinion. Right. And if you tell them, I, I usually preface it on the radio, I'm lucky enough to say, this is anonymous. No one knows who you are. They can't see you. But on a film, we had to have the release form. Sure. Everything, right. So. Oh, so uh, on the show, you, <clears throat> you don't introduce them by name or... Is that what you're saying? Maybe first name. I, I okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's always a good idea because there's a lot of weirdos out there. Now. <laughs> I'm Clay Pigeon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You are. <laughs> I just wonder if... If you reveal, let's say, your gnome to radio, <laughs> or is that in public information that that's your coin to name your your I think, you know, persona? I mean, you think people if know? You, if you, Where does that come from, by the way? Uh, long ago, when I was on the radio in Tampa, I came in mm -hmm. to do my show one night, and the man on before me was like, how are you doing, you know? And uh, I said, oh, it's one of those days I feel like everybody's shooting me down. They're just shooting me down. He said, you're like a clay pigeon. Right. And just it is, it a is. little bell went off in my head, and I said, I'm going to call myself that from now on. So, But, you know, my cousin and my brother are both in broadcasting. And, oh, yeah? And I think, uh, you know, it's not unusual in, to, mm -hmm. to have a, a stage name or right. a, an air name. I like the idea of having yeah. a, a you know, micro a microphone it. or some name like that. Uh-huh. I should have thought of that years ago. When we started Not too this. late. <laughs> yeah, no, I've heard that. Exp I think there was even a sh TV show called Clay Pigeons or something, or a movie, a movie, movie yeah, a, yeah. right? A film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I grew up I listening think I saw to, to small town radio where the right. jocks would have names like the Worry Bird and <laughs> yeah, you know. Wolfman Jack. <laughs> right, right. I love all that. Yeah. Again, one October directed by Rachel Schumann, and I noticed, uh, and you edited, it, as hmm. you admitted. Produced by Garrett uh, Savage. Uh, I actually know a couple of people. I know Paul Brill. Oh, he, having... he did an amazing job on the score. I have to give a little plug for that. Yes. He did a fantastic job. Yeah. He uh, he also scored 
the Joan Rivers documentary right. some years ago, and I showed it. I have a film series, which actually I'm, I'm resurrecting next week. Uh, it's called Docularius. It's about funny documentaries. Different. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> That's showed, a good one. <laughs> several years ago, I showed uh, the Joan Rivers documentary, and, and one of the co-directors came, and uh, Paul, okay. as well as their editor, going to forget but but uh, so we we did a whole joke telling contest it was kind of a fun <laughs> night and then this coming next week um downtown just blocks away from where we are right now i'll be showing i'm going to plug my film series since we're yeah i'm posting this before that uh it's called very semi-serious about the new yorker magazine cartoon department and the editor of the cartoons and all these contributing cartoonists and so in a rare exception uh I'm not going to actually have any filmmakers speak or able to come for this screening, but I have four New Yorker cartoonists who are going to oh, be, including great. Bob Benkoff, who is oh, the, the editor of the cartoon section, and they're going to be at the screening. So it's, it's a really nice doc. It's a great documentary. It's on HBO, but you, you can't meet the can't, cartoonists no. at, on HBO. So. No. <laughs> That's my So we're going to be doing that. It's on uh, Monday the 22nd. Oh, great. Down at DCTV. Do you, do you oh, know? Yeah, I know DCTV. Yeah. yeah. Any documentary worth their salt she <laughs> probably is run. So, yeah, this lends itself to uh, 1 November, of course, <laughs> or December, what have you. So, yeah, you know, there, there's gets... been talk about, about that, <laughs> of what's the next um, I'm sure. installment yeah. of it. I mean, tr yeah, truthfully, I feel like it's, it's a film that could be made around any given moment and in, 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 in other cities mm -hmm. too. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the film was inspired by a Chris Marker film. Right. Oh um, yeah. I meant to mention that. that the great uh, uh, French experimental filmmaker, Chris right. Marker. Yeah. His mm -hmm. film, Le Jolie May, which was also for him <laughs> inspired by Chronicle of the Summer by oh. uh, Jean Rouge. Okay. Um, and, yeah. So the whole, yeah. Those, those French <laughs> in the early sixties doing these um, kind of, you yes. know, one yeah, of the yeah, first, yeah. yeah. Groups of people to go out on the street and, right. and talk to people because right. the equipment suddenly was lighter and right. they, they could go out yeah, there and do yeah. that. But mm -hmm. he made this portrait of um, Paris um, in the month of May of 1962, and it. So I just I feel like I just loved the idea of that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so I I feel like you know you, you could do it of you know Istanbul or where I don't yes, know right. oh, that's true. San Francisco or just right. sort of we can make a portrait of a place um, or a time you know. So I could I could see doing one again in yeah. New York. Yeah, right makes sense, absolutely. And Clay, your show again is on. At it's six, on Thursdays, Thursdays at six p.m. You know. The Dusty Show with Clay Pigeon. The Dusty Show with Clay Pigeon. Thursdays at six p.m. on WFMU Radio out of uh, Jersey City, right? New right, Jersey, right? And it is free form, so it's different every week. It's not always street interviews. Gotcha. The last couple of weeks, I've just been going bananas, just <laughs> really and symbols into the ground and railing uh -huh. uh, uh, on society and. Making an ass out of myself and loving every second. <laughs> um, I'll have to make a point of catching up then. You have to, man. Yeah. You have to, you have to I, come on sometime. I'd love to. Anytime. Just just name it. I, you do the show in New Jersey or do you do it yeah, here? Yeah, at, at, uh, right at there, the, uh, the right across the river on Montgomery Street in Jersey City. It's mm -hmm. like a little, little path, path right, right, away. right away. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful station. It really is. The only other kind, I know it's also on your crew was Jessica Wolfson, some consulting in some fashion or other. Yeah, consulting producer. She's a friend, and mm -hmm. she um, actually, she did a documentary with her husband on Bob Fass. Bob Fass, I saw that, yeah. Actually, and I went to a, a Bob, who got on my show, so you're not the first <laughs> radio personality, uh, and it, it's on WFMU, right? Isn't he? No, he was... Um... Yeah. Bob, no, he was not WFMU. I cannot. So okay, don't worry about. Yeah. Anyway, he they they tape out of uh, up at Columbia. Um, anyway, so he invited me. It's an overnight show, you know. It's also and he does it like once a week or something. I don't know if he's still doing it now. This was about two years ago, and he was, you know, having a hard time getting around as it was. The guy's a legend. Anyway, it was a, it was great just great sitting film. through and yeah. watch, like sitting and just observing. Yeah, yeah. And do a show, you know. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Some magic about doing radio, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is kind of uh, magical uh, because you you can't see it. Right, you have to project your imagination onto things. But also, people that are doing it, they really love, like when I'm in a studio situation doing the show. Or, right, you know, the, the, there's just something that goes on there that's just really just ama People just love the the environment. Right. Um, I I feel lucky to have a show because it's definitely a lot of people waiting to do it. So right, 
<laughs> I just have to keep waiting. Did hey, we... can I say one more thing? Please, you... no, okay, no. Okay. You Go can ahead. cut it out if you. No, I, I just wanted to circle back to like the, our, the beginning oh, part yeah. of our conversation because. Um, Please do. One thing about the film is it's it's it's, it's a little bit tipped toward being a love letter in a way of New York because mm -hmm. part part of interspersed between the interviews are these vignettes of of the streets of New York. Right. And yes, I was trying to show kind of what I what was still there in New York that I loved about it mm -hmm. um, with the hope that it would inspire people to recognize kind of what might be disappearing and to think a little bit more about what kind of city right. they do want to yes. have. Um, yeah. So anyway, I just want no, to, it's yeah, a, I just I'm glad to you, I'm it's glad not, it's not I'm just gl a tirade. Right. Against, no, no, no. Yeah. It, right. And if I, if I in, kind of made it like sound like it was, I apologize because oh, no, it's no, really, just, it isn't uh, just about that or old crusty people relating about the bygone days of <laughs> New York. I enjoyed it very much. I really appreciate, you know, having the opportunity to see it and to meet you both yeah, and to talk so about much. the film. And I, you know, really wish you both so much success with it. It's nice to meet you. Radio uh, handshake. Radio. Is <laughs> it's right. We have to, that's when you have to say you're shaking hands. <laughs> so, cause people can't see it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what were you doing over in Europe? I was singing. Singing? Mm -hmm. yeah. I used to be a singer. I worked in cabarets on cruise ships and stage and everywhere. Never been married? <laughs> yes, twice. Drummer? Yeah, how'd you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's always those dog yeah. dog drummers, Terry. <laughs> yeah, I was a drummer. Oh, the drummers always get the pretty girls. How long did you go out? We were married for seven years. Married for seven years? Yeah, the... Seven years. <laughs> and then who Don't got, even ask. Who got the itch? That's what I, who got the seven year itch? I any... think it was me. Did you really? Yes, I'm the scarlet woman. Yes. You had an affair? No, just a wandering eye. Right now, Big Sonia, the documentary, uh, is um, having a uh, campaign to raise funds. The campaign is called Small Matters Big because every contribution no matter how big or small matters. Every donation helps this wonderful documentary get to the big screen. So their their idea is to get it onto as many screens as possible and kind of in the theatrical, and they're going to have to be investing in, in that process. So, or they want to make an impact, and um, they need everybody's help. So uh, just go to uh, womenyoushouldfund.com and search for Big Sonia. They are trying to raise $75,000. And they have like a month or so to go uh, to do that, to get Big Sonia on as many screens as possible and get it out of there. You know, there aren't that many. First of all, this is almost a this is such a rewarding film in so many ways. But let me just tell you, it's so wonderful. When you read about this film, you're going to want to see it. And when you see Big Sonia in action, you're going to be just so blown away and you're going to want to meet her. So the only way to meet her is to get this film into screenings all over the place. Because Sonia, even at her advanced age of, I think she's 91 or 92, she's out there. She hasn't slowed down. She's an amazing powerhouse. So you got to meet this woman. And she, there aren't that many survivors of the Holocaust around anymore. Every day, I don't know the numbers, but so many die. So it's so important that, that everybody meets Sonia. That's my thing. So let's get into it now. First, we're going to meet with Todd Soliday and um, Leah Wachowski. And then right after that, we're going to go directly into a conversation with the team behind Women You Should Fund, Jennifer Jones and Cynthia Hornig, who are the team behind Women You Should no, and women you should fund. You'll get to know what all that's about. Uh, but they're teaming with the team. With they're teaming with Leah and Todd to raise money for Big Sonia next phase of that project. So right now, let's get into those conversations. I think it's really important that Sonia's telling her story now. Keeps changing people's lives like she did mine. I've been incarcerated for 32 years, and nothing can compare to that. She's a lot tougher than I am. Yeah. They understood me. I, I reached their hearts, I think. Well, for a number of years now, the mall has been in decline. It's been a, a constant concern that they're going to tear it down. Please allow this letter to serve as formal notice of your lease cancellation. So. I can't imagine what will happen when she can't go into the store every day. I have no idea. It'll be a sad day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
We're here with the creative team behind Big Sonia. How's that? Yes, perfect. <laughs> uh, co-directors Todd Soliday and Leah Warshawski and producer. You, you also produced Leah. Yes. Todd, you just co-directed. I co-directed and, and co-directed. And co-directed? <laughs> Which was more challenging for you? Uh, the second. <laughs> I could tell. Yeah, I also I also am the cinematographer and editor, oh, are you editor? And okay. Oh wow. You other things. So. Okay, that's a lot. It's a home. It's a homemade movie. Is that your background editing or? Uh, I came from actually. I was a writer when I started in television, mm-hmm. and uh, it okay. just kept evolving. I, I was in post production before this. Very good. And uh, and started doing more documentaries when I met Leah. Well, I saw Big Sonia, which is the the film uh, we're at hand here. We're talking about, and which was. By the way, he's going to have a, um, a a fundraising campaign, which is what why we're kind of meeting at this particular moment in time. Because you guys are getting prepared for the. I mean, it's been this film has been in the festival circuit for a while. I saw it last November, Doc NYC. So, and it's already May of 2017, but it's going into the next phase. I mean, there are a number of phases, including theatrical, including broadcast, potentially including yes. streaming, and 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 then all sort of ancillary things that you you guys are no doubt doing around it in terms yes. of educational <laughs> yes. distribution. So you need some money for that. I'm, right. I'm sure it brings up a whole new... Uh, it's phase, we call it phase two. Phase two, which it's is post-festival post, two. Which is post festival Yeah, it's, life. I, I guess it's distribution and outreach for us, and that yeah. I think a lot of people assume that when you're done with the film uh, that you're done and maybe you get a decent deal and you hand the film over and you and start you your away. next project, and that's not... Uh-huh. really the case with this film for a number of reasons so well one reason sonia of the title is your grandma and yes. you can't walk away from that <laughs> so it's you're stuck I've with the story for a long I've time i've tried a few tried, times yeah. yeah we we began filming when she was 85 she's 91 now mm-hmm. and we had always said you know when we started the project we'd said our ultimate goal was to finish in time for her to be a part of our outreach and it just so turns out that she's actually always wanted to be a movie star. And so... One can, I can tell. She's like living it up yeah. at the festivals. We can't get her off the dance floor, especially <laughs> when we win. Um, one and more so, party. <laughs> just one more party, I promise. <laughs> she's... Yeah, she can outlast all of us. And um, so it's it's been fun. She's come to two festivals so far. We're bringing her to another one. And then once we do the theatrical release this fall, she wants to be a part of as many you know, the cities as she can. And so it's about to get even more crazy. Uh, She's definitely got the travel bug all of a sudden. Wow. Well, let me just read from, um, this is verbatim from the marketing language on your website, but I want to give people a little bit of the context too. I know we're revising that. (laughs) Okay. Well, you can, if you have, if you want to revise as I say it, or just tell me not to say Uh, it, that's fine too, because there's no harm in that. Standing tall at four foot eight, maybe you have to revise that. Now she might be four foot seven. No, she. Sh- yeah, well, she is shrinking, but we yeah. won't. We'll we're all shrinking. <laughs> we're all shrinking. I just yeah. want to shrink. You know? <laughs> Standing tall at four foot eight inches, Sonia is one of the last remaining Holocaust survivors living in Kansas in Kansas City, and one of the only survivors who speaks publicly about her wartime experience. Sonia's enormous personality and fragile frame mask the horrors she endured. At 15, she watched her mother disappear behind the gas chamber doors. Sonia's teenage years were a blur of concentration camps and death marches. On Liberation Day, she was accidentally shot through the chest, yet again miraculously survived. Sonia is the ultimate survivor, a bridge between cultures and generations. Where did Big Sonia, the documentary, have its world premiere? So we actually had a bi-coastal world premiere. We were in Napa Mm -hmm. and New York, where we saw you at Duck NYC, during the same 10-day span. And so Sonia came to Napa with us, Mm -hmm. and then uh, she wasn't able to come to New York. So we we were on both coasts in the same week. And we premiered the film the day after the election. And so that's been an interesting journey as well. I don't think we've slept since then, but it's also been really... um, amazing the response that we're getting at festivals Mm -hmm. because of our current landscape right now. Right. Todd, did you have something to add? Edit here. (laughs) No problem. Yeah, and I I would say that audience response in in the wake of the angry climate out there Mm -hmm. has been uh, one where people don't want to leave during Q and A. People, right. it's, it's, a, it's it's therapeutic. Safe house. Yeah, it's I a imagine. safe house. People are looking for yeah. a hopeful story, or looking for you know. I think you go in thinking the film is one thing. Maybe it's a Jewish film. Maybe it's a Holocaust story. But it's 
um, even for us in our as we produced it, it became something else. Mm-hmm. And and right now, its audiences are calling it an, an antidote to the climate out there. Uh, I guess you mean there's a lot of division and a lot of uh, r- anger, divide. and yeah. there's a deep divide, and there's a lot of uh, anger, and there's uh, just uh, you know a deranged goofball in in yeah. leader in the role of leadership in, in here. Sony obviously really relates to that. Yeah. She, what, what what is her, yeah? I was going to ask you next what her take on the well. Our our rule with current. Sonia is that we don't talk about politics. Oh really? Really? We, it's it, it's never a good idea to talk too much about politics with your own family. That's very true. And so we keep that rule with okay. Sonia. I think what happens in our film is that the message of love over hate, you know, love over politics, love over all else, love wins. I guess mm. um, is really resonating with people on all you know from all cultures and ages and races and on both sides of the of this political divide. spectrum and yeah. so all we know is that there's a divide and we're yeah. you know i guess trying to bridge an empathy gap yeah. there what's that and, and we we do want to reach people from all walks of life and people with different beliefs and so um the film is able to open up some of those harder conversations we hope right yeah i'm i'm certain the uh, well i i mean like the, the description that i read maybe is, it sounds heavy. I mean, there are aspects of it that, that are. But, you know, at four foot eight, she really is larger than life. And she's yeah. a, a very entertaining subject for a film. So she's, you know, you're going to enjoy. There's a lot of, it's an entertaining film is my there point. Are, there are a lot of laughs. And we very intentionally start the movie in the very first 30 seconds. Right. Um, Sonia is funny. Yeah. She's tiny, um, but with hair that you can only see over the steering wheel of her car right. because she's so small yes. and her car so big. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's a wildly entertaining film on top of a really dark subject. Right. And I, I don't yeah. think audiences expect that when they go in. And it's like I want to stand up in front of the audience before and just give them permission. Yes, she's funny. Laugh at her. Right. It's great. She yeah. loves it. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure she does, right? She, she must really love connecting with uh, the audiences and... I think, you know, at 91, she's kind of, she's found a new purpose and Mm -hmm. she's been reinvigorated and she's really now um, trying, you know, frantically to get her message out as fast as she can. I feel like in the last couple of years, she's become more kind of driven to that and there's more anxiety and it feels like she's just in a rush to try and get it all out as quickly as she can because you don't know what's going to happen. You know, she's... sure. Yeah, she's she's doing good right now. We just you never know oh yeah what can happen in life and so I feel like you feel a sense of urgency. I feel a sense of urgency and she feels a sense of urgency and the film is a good way to amplify all of that and really we couldn't have chosen a, a better path and in some ways I'm glad for the timing of it. It seems like it's a good film to be out right now after the election and mm-hmm. it seems very relevant and timely in a way that we didn't expect and so we're just trying to hang on for the ride and be as smart as we can about all of the next steps to make sur- sure that the most people can see this movie. Sure. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how many festivals have you played in roughly, do you think? Uh, roughly a- around 25 to oh, okay. 30 so That's far. We've won um, seven or said, eight awards. Yeah, you we said just, you just <laughs> won one coming in. Well, we as just won f- an audience award you, um, from Philadelphia. Uh-huh. Jewish Film Festival. We were okay. there last mm-hmm. night or two nights ago, mm-hmm. and we've got more festivals we're waiting to hear back from, and then we're going to initiate this crowdfunding campaign on May 15. Um, and so we're hoping that we can raise enough to start bringing the film to theaters. You know, of course, New York and L.A. and Kansas City are first, and then we'll see how well we do from there, but I that's, imagine that's you- the goal. I imagine, given how many Jewish film festivals there are, I mean, every city has at least at least one. Yeah, we've applied to cases. almost all of them. <laughs> so, didn't you have to turn down? You know, like then after you got accepted to a, over once you start seeing overlapping and how many, you let's say you get thirty that say you know accept you, you got to dwindle it down because oh it's yeah, just like, we d- we definitely. I mean, we're trying to be smart hit. about the process, yeah. and also we're negotiating screening fees where we can because mm-hmm. that income helps us sure, with distribution. Right. So that's part of our plan. And then, you know, we don't show up at every festival. We show up at the ones that make sense for us to show up at. We try to be smart about that. And we're going to Jewish festivals, but we're also going to non-Jewish festivals at the same time, yeah. which is a little crazy, but you might not believe this, but we actually haven't gotten into a lot of the festivals that we've applied for. Mm-hmm. So even yes, we're going to many, but there are many that we've received rejections from. Right. And so it's really an emotional roller coaster, this whole festival 
process. I don't think it gets easier. I don't think the rejection gets easier. No. I think it yeah. maybe gets harder. <laughs> um, so well, that's been tough. Yeah. Well, there's so many documents. I mean, you know, I don't know. There, but people should know that not only are there jo- Jewish film festivals, there's obviously quite a few documentary festivals. So oh, yeah. there's, you know, different. Hunt thousands probably now, do you think? At this point. Well, I don't know about that. Is documentary festivals? You think? Oh, I would think there are a lot like, more yeah, Jewish Every time you festivals. go on without a box uh-huh. or, or there's film a new freeway, documentary there's film. it's interesting, there's right? All these new festivals. Yeah, it's I don't I'm not sure. Well, there's definitely the revenue a, model works for them. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't know, but it is. An, I always say that you know festivals for a lot of films. I'm not talking about Big Sonia because you guys have. I think you as you already referenced, you have a theatrical planned in the fall, and um, I'm sure there's no doubt you'll you'll get a all sorts of other opportunities, uh, certainly theatrical and or institutional. This is a natural. For a lot of films, the, the sheer number of festivals is, in a way, its distribution system for yeah. some films. Yeah, I think people, a lot of audiences will see it. I yeah, mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I agree. No, there's nothing wrong. I love festivals for so yeah. many different reasons. Yeah. Um, it's definitely a good way to get eyeballs on your film. And if you have merchandise to sell and somebody to sell it, I mean, there are w- definite ways to use the festivals as a way to to earn some of your money back but that's a lot of work as well yeah. or even just you it's know great for press local press, local press you know getting people excited and the, all the people that you meet sure. um that end up on your mailing list so it's it's a road show I, but it's worth it i just was at the maryland film festival this oh, last okay. week i i just had a great great experience oh, good. There. I haven't, that's good to know i haven't heard much about it oh it's but really I, it's a great festival and i saw some several documentaries oh good mm-hmm. So well, they def- we'll definitely have a healthy up. number of doc- Yeah, it's a, one of the best indie, Great. like B level indie fe- independent. I love that. Well, we American haven't indies. we haven't screened there yet. So <laughs> our list, I think, is at 182 right now. Festivals that we're applying to or that are on our radar. So we're wait, but are you still them. planning on more festivals? Oh, are you kidding? Yeah, no, okay, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So you, so <laughs> we in, can't uh, get enough. So, it's like so you would go right up masochistic. to the right, right up to the theatrical. Oh yeah. Okay. We're we're screening it as much as humanly possible um and not you know screening it but also not going broke at the same time mm-hmm. and so as long as we can do that do both we're going to screen it where we can mm-hmm. um obviously we're not going to screen it in places where we're planning to release mm-hmm. uh anymore so you know we we won't have a new york screening until mm-hmm. it's in theaters and same yeah, with los sense. angeles we haven't um, been in a la film festival oh, okay. at all we didn't get into any yet mm-hmm. so that'll be a bigger one in right. kansas city Right, of course, that's yeah. a natural. That's a natural. And hopefully Chicago that's and St. Sonia Louis. That's where Sonia yeah. lives, right? Yeah. And the yeah. film, actually, since you mentioned it, uh, I think uh, it's been now about four or five months since I've seen the film, but I do remember that uh, she she runs a store in the mall. Correct? Tailor shop, yes. A ta- oh, right, she ta- that's right. She's a tailor, and so people come in. She has a relationship with some customers for decades, it seems yes. like. Yes, yes. And then she finds out she has to vacate, right? I, I, it's a rent yeah, issue? Well, they're... Tearing the mall down. Oh, they're tearing the mall yeah, down. Yeah, the that most is... iconic mall in the Midwest, probably. Everyone who's been to Kansas City or lived in mm-hmm. Kansas City knows about the mall. And they're just, ironically, uh, they just started tearing it down oh. last week. Really? When we were there. So it's and been like two years. I'm assuming this well, was like you shot this like more it's than... It's been six years six since, years we since started that filming. And then they start tearing our location down about a week before did we're they doing our around? crowdfunding campaign. Oh, I see. <laughs> So yeah. I don't know what that means. I don't know. It's a sign. I don't know what it's a sign of, but it's the end of an era for sure. Well, it's, a, it's a metaphor for Sonia's resilience. I, I was standing out in front of the mall three days ago watching Did she... watching the bricks come down and, and thinking about how late Sonia kept us out the night before at dinner. And, <laughs> and you know, this, this mall that was in existence for 40 plus years is, is outlived by, by this woman who, you know, temporarily was a tenant there. Mm-hmm. And she's still going strong. We can't tell you what she's doing now because then you don't really have a reason to see the movie. But we can tell you that she's doing better than ever. And we couldn't have written. The out- we, we we couldn't have written a better ending. Well, tell me now. I, I can't well, tell you the part. end of the movie. No, I can't. <laughs> You'll have to go back and watch it. Okay. Fair enough. Right. <laughs> Theater, though, please. <laughs> don't use our link. Exactly. No, no, no. Uh, that's... <laughs> I was just looking to see if there's any other folks here we want to... And Leah... Um, Who should we mention the women you should know? Yeah, well, we just sat with uh, with the uh, women that uh, are behind the women you should... <laughs> f- 
know the and women fund. behind the women? Yeah, the team behind uh, Women You Should Know and Fund, uh, and, and Women You Should Fund, which is uh, going to be the platform, your, your fundraising platform, correct? Yes, and you know, we've used, we used Kickstarter for our last film mm -hmm. for finishing funds, and we knew that we needed to do a crowdfunding campaign for Big Sonia, but we didn't want to do... We didn't want to go the traditional route, and we wanted to do something that was a little unique. And about the same time we were thinking about it, I saw that the Women You Should Know women um, were starting a new site that's essentially just like Kickstarter, but for female-driven projects and right. female-backed projects. And um, we had had a relationship with them for a couple of years because I think I wrote a blog for them about our film at one point, and our graphic designer has also been featured on their site. And um, And so it seemed like a really perfect fit <laughs> and we're, we're excited to just do something different of course a lot of people still don't understand what crowdfunding is so we're still explaining mm. like actually you have to pledge and if you if we don't reach our goal we don't get the money just just like kickstarter and so we're doing a lot of education around it but i think it's i'm excited to just get it started and get through it well the other uh, seems like value add at least from for the women you can f you should fund is that uh unlike kickstarter which is a wonderful platform, but you bring you you're creating your network yes, around yeah, it, you and very you're bringing, rarely bring people. So in. if you're doing a second one, which a lot of people do, you know, and but you know it, it's hard to go back to the well. First right. of all, because you're you're you know you're asking your dentist, we, Uncle which, Bob, yeah, for, which we do anyway. <laughs> I, <laughs> yes. I understand, of course, but it sucks. But, yeah. the, it, but you do, and you do create a, a bigger community, which yeah, is a support yeah. system for the for all these iterations of. Of, of the process of getting your film out into the world, and they're with you now, which is wonderful. The nice little advantage of Women You Should Fund, from what I just found out, is that they actually have been creating, through Women You Should Know, a community for a long time, and so they're exactly. bringing that they with them. They already have a strong brand. Yeah, um, and they're bringing, a, they're bringing some of that aforementioned crowd that you're sourcing <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> with them. Yes. And with, so it's, it's nice to have that additional. It's great. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it will hopefully amplify population. our reach for sure. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's one of the other reasons that we decided to partner with them. So they yeah. are, they already have a great base of support and people who I hope will be interested in our project. And for a reward, it seems to me like if you tell me if I pledge say $50 or $150, let's say that Sonia will tailor my um, oh, my suit jacket. Do that for cheaper than that if you just walk into the shop. But, <laughs> okay. Um, we have some really interesting and fun incentives. Yeah, you can. I think it's eighteen dollars for a yeah. sleeve alteration. alteration. But we do have an incentive um, where she she will leave a voice message on your phone, just like Carl Castle from oh, yeah. NPR. And so we do have one of those incentives. Wait, wait, have, don't tell. Yes, yeah, so we have a mm -hmm. ton of artwork, original artwork by some of the people mm -hmm. who've worked on the movie. We have um, credits that we're giving away for certain amounts. We have printed letterpress poem and paintings and tons of Sonia swag, whatever bags and hats. And I, every time I run into you guys, I get uh, brand new. <laughs> I've got pens. I've got now every, stickers. I think we bring you something every the time. License, yeah, we've got Sonia's license plate. The one that we made. Yeah, um, stickers and pens and sewing kits and everything. This is fantastic. Yeah, we we try to keep it fun for us. The marketing yeah. is fun for us. So yeah, check out um, fund.bigsonia.com anytime after May 15. Yes. And yeah, get and and kick in, get involved. Yeah, please, please do. We'll be uh, helping um, bring awareness to Big Sonia, which is really is a great, an entertaining documentary about your grandmother, uh, Sonia Warshawski. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're excited. Thanks, thanks for finally sitting down with us. Oh, I'm so glad we finally did. You know, thank you both uh, very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so let me introduce you guys. Sitting here at the offices of a Women You Should Know, uh, but is there is there even a different company? I mean, that technically, or is that there is? We started as Outhouse PR, mm -hmm. which gave rise There's to Women the voice You Should of Know. Jennifer Jones, by the way. Oh, shall I introduce myself? No, I just did. Great, that's <laughs> yeah. covered then. So yeah. we started as Outhouse PR, which gave rise to Women uh -huh. You Should Know, which gave rise to Women You, women should, you should Fund. fund. So all What's three next? operate here. Okay, and then she's joined by co-founder. When she, I think you were using the pronoun we. So the we includes Cynthia Hornig, who is sitting to her left. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> nice meeting you both, by the way. And, and we're here because uh, I, I have seen this documentary called Big Sonia, which is, you know, terrific and has been on the 
festival circuit this last year. I think I saw it at Doc NYC last November, in fact. So it's continuing to have an amazing run of festivals, which is not so surprising. So they used your platform for Women You Should Fund, essentially to help finance some aspects of their their film, right? The or campaign the, actually it, goes live next week, which it does. we're very oh, excited about. Mm-hmm. Okay. Talk, so what Leah and Todd are doing... The co-direct... Well, Leah's the director. Todd is the producer, right? Yes, mm-hmm. correct. And mm-hmm. what they are doing is they're using the platform mm-hmm. to help fund a various a, a variety of projects surrounding the film. Oh, right. Which is a how to get involved type of thing. There's, you know, usually there's all these now uh, ancillary ways of being involved in a project. Like, yes. like Big Sonia, which yes. is about a uh, Leah Warshawski's grandmother, who is a Holocaust survivor. Sonia. Sonia, who has been vital and, and independent for years, even now as she's, I, I don't even know what, how old she is. At this she's day. 91. 91 years old. God bless. And uh, But there are projects that they're going to continue right after the film. Like, Right, so which, which was what you're referring to? They're crowdfunding specifically for four different projects. Mm-hmm. So it's for it's way too much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, it's not. Well, there are four levels within one project, so it makes it it, it makes it, it oh, okay. makes a lot of sense. It's so obviously, isn't that they're in the festival circuit still, and as that was winding down, and they're getting ready now for the next level of getting the film out into the world, which is generally exhibition and broadcast and you know yada yada. So they're raising money for what the, that's going to look like. Is, it, to be general about it. Correct. And we met Leah a couple of years ago when she first made the film. And she actually wrote a piece. She contributed a piece for Women You Should Know okay. about making the film and how much it meant to her to tell her grandmother's largely untold story, obviously, mm. outside the context of their yes. family. Right. So we've been in touch with her ever since. And when we made the announcement that we were launching Women You Should Fund, Mm -hmm. she got in touch and she said, I have an idea and I want to work on this with you. Mm -hmm. So that's where we've been. Hi, Cynthia. Hi. Hi, Adam. How are you? (laughs) Good, good. Is there particular types of projects that you guys, meaning Women You Should Fund, support in particular or try to create campaigns around in particular? There isn't a theme. We're really okay. looking for people who want to create new products. Women, films, though, Women, yes. It's women and women-led projects. So yeah. it could be gender diverse, but a woman has to be the lead of the project. Okay. Um, and it could be anything from small businesses, nonprofits, products, um, inventions, pretty much the gamut mm-hmm. of, of different types of campaigns. There's a large variety. And have you set up a, like... What's the process, I should ask? What What is the process for, let's say, someone like uh, Leah or someone who has a, such a, a product or project to um, seek, seek out your platform? I mean, it's a very simple process. Mm-hmm. It's a um, women you should know and women you should fund. So they mm-hmm. ca- that's one of the main points of differentiation for us. But the mm-hmm. process itself is as simple as just uploading a project to the site and we take a look at it give feedback, give them some ideas on how to make their project better, Mm -hmm. um, and then support them with Women You Should Know by sharing it with our large community of Women You Should Know to help them promote their project. I see. So it's, um, so there is a, describe that part of it then. You're saying there is a a community around this as well? So Mm -hmm. one of the unique points of differentiation about what we're doing with Women You Should Fund is that it has a built-in community of like-minded people. You are not going to find that at your typical crowdfunding platform. Usually you have to create it yourself or bring it yourself, Correct. And most people are driven Mm -hmm. to a platform by a specific campaign. Mm -hmm. So we have been working for the last six years to build a very robust, very engaged community with Mm -hmm. women you should know. Mm -hmm. So with all of the assets we have from that brand, we are going to use those assets to help further... Mm-hmm. excuse me, projects on Women You Should Fund. Mm-hmm. So once a campaign goes live on Women You Should Fund, which Leah's project is going live on Monday, we are going to fully engage every asset we have so that our Women You Should Know community is aware of her campaign. Mm-hmm. And the community is a combination of men and women, but all who believe in the power of supporting women and their ideas to change the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, great. And and so ha- have you done a bunch of films? Or are there... I mean, if you've been doing this for like six years, you say? Women You Should or, Know launched in 2011, 
And okay. we just launched Women You Should Fund actually in March of 2017. Oh, so it's a baby. Baby. It's a puppy. It's our sister brand, and she's the little yeah. sister, and uh-huh. the big sister is going to take very good care of her and okay. show her the ropes. So really, it really is in there, in its infancy, for essentially speaking. Uh, so you, have you, how many projects are you, have you guys uh, launched yet? We actually had to fast track the launch. We were not supposed oh, to really? go live in March, but we had an amazing opportunity with the Harriet Tubman Home. Oh, tell me about that. Yeah, that's a nonprofit Uh um, that for the last hundred plus years has worked to preserve the homestead that Harriet Tubman lived on up in Auburn, New York. So um, we had an incredible opportunity to help them Mm. raise funds they needed to go to an auction to try to save a rare photo of Harriet Tubman from the auction block. Oh, it was going to be auctioned off. So yes. Th- this, this, and this, the house is a, is it a house in Auburn, Auburn, New York, which is now like a museum. It was is actually it? designated a national park in January oh, of 2017. As it well, should be. And so they want to put the keep the photo, this photograph, correct, in the house. Yes, and right? the photo was actually taken in Auburn of mm-hmm. Harriet Tubman when she was in her late 30s, which is. <clears throat> incredibly rare. The, there's yeah. only a few photos of her that actually exist, and most wow. of them are when she was in her mm-hmm. much later years. So you just have to say, sorry, Oprah, you can't have it, okay? <laughs> but unfortunately, <laughs> despite the campaign being yep. a wild success, mm-hmm. we had national press everywhere. We I exceeded bet. the campaign yep. goal. The day we got to the auction, we got completely pummeled because the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National African American Museum pulled resources and came to the table with upwards of one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and the so. photo was estimated at twenty to thirty thousand. I see. So what happened? Dare I ask? Well, the photo went to the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian African American Museum, um, which is great because at least it didn't go yes. to a private. Collection, collector, which was sort which, of our biggest fear right. that no one would see this photo again. Yeah. Um, and the Harriet Tubman Home has a relationship with them, so hopefully there'll be opportunities for educational programming right. and things like that about the photo. Is that so? I guess the photo's in Washington, right? Is that where I would it, guess? Liz, yes, Liz? I would guess that would mm-hmm. be where it is right now. Right. Yeah, okay. I don't, we have no so idea is, when. Go ahead. I apologize. No, that's okay. We don't know when the when they'll be putting it on display or what the process right. is for that. So. Right. I yeah. understand. So, and is that particular project, was that, be, uh, you took it on because it was Harry Tubman? Or is it there are women who are spearheading this, uh, or spearheading getting the photo back and bringing some attention to the uh, the house, the park in the house? Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman is... Is that is, the way through way? She, or way through well, in this case? Well, I mean, yeah. she's, she's by in, far yeah. one of the most significant women from American history. Uh, yeah. Um, and given the opportunity to have a chance to help preserve her legacy mm-hmm. in such a momentous way was something that we jumped at when sure. the opportunity presented itself. The CEO of the Harriet Tubman Home is a woman. And, oh, um, there you go. And we okay. wanted to work with her as it well. It seems all, yeah, perfect kind to, of project. To, to do this tag team effort um, to help bring Harriet home. That's what the campaign was. Unfortunately, it did not succeed in terms of what we set out to do and getting that photo at the auction block. However, what it did do was it cast a giant spotlight on the Harriet Tubman home and the work that they do, Mm -hmm. which is extraordinary. Um, And it's up in Auburn, New York, so not a lot of people know about what they're doing up there. Right. Where is that? I mean, is it how far upstate is Auburn, New York? It's about a five-hour drive from New York City, so 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 close to Syracuse. Yeah, it sounds like it's uh, further north, of course, than Albany. Yeah, and so they, it's fairly uh, close to the Hudson, or is it? I'm not, oh, now I, you're I asking me questions of geography, and I'm going to have to pull out a map. <laughs> don't, no, don't do that. <laughs> like, like it matters. Any, I mean, Auburn, New York, five hours away. It's about a 45-minute drive from the University of Syracuse. Okay, that's that's good. So if you're there, by the way, if you're in if you're in the Syracuse area or in this, that snow belt, as they call it, you should go over to the Harry Tubman Museum or National. State Park? National Park? National Park, National yep. Park. And help. By the way, I was just wondering if, if the damn Library of Congress hadn't uh, stepped in and hustled this thing, were, were you prepared at least to to block any potential private purchasers we, uh, we of, went, for that photo? The photo was estimated at, at 20, 20 30. to 30,000. We went in with a healthy 60,000 oh, plus. Very good. So we felt very confident walking As, into that room that morning. I bet. Um, as soon as the lot came up yeah. and a bajillion hands got thrown up in the air with their auction paddles, we knew that we were, we were in for a tough road ahead. Yeah. Um, it hit 50 within a nanosecond. So Yeah, that's just like 
you don't even have time to respond, no. <laughs> react to it. It's no. almost maybe it's just it's like ripping off the bandage. It was very difficult That's, to process yeah, what was unfolding was. all around us. But yeah, again, no it's, time to get on the phone and talk to your people about raising another five thousand dollars. The best place for it to have, to have gone would have been home to sure, sure. you know where it belongs however right. it's in the second best place and we're thrilled Absolutely. that it will no, be no. protected right. no, you, and no, right. you know more people will be able to take advantage of it and see it and experience it right and also maybe they maybe i don't know how these things work so i'm just talking out you know my uh any orifice but it's like you know maybe there's a loan situation they can lend you potentially the, or at least uh, you know they, they do about. have an image of it at the harriet tubman home yeah um it's not quite the same as having the photo itself which is actually only about three by five, so yeah. it's a teeny little photo. Oh, okay. Um, but we're certain that they'll develop mm -hmm. some kind of curriculum and programming right. around the photo and the historic nature and the whole campaign itself because gotcha. it was really exciting for them. I tell you what, I will do. I will. If for, you say you have like about fifty thousand dollars sitting around that obviously you didn't get to use, I use that. I, I will take it to. I will go get it and bring it if it comes down. To, if you, <laughs> I'll work it out. Just, just give me the fifty thousand. Well, Consider it like insurance. Out. What? <laughs> I can't work, work your magic. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, is this must be project number two or three? I'm going to guess because it's like March was just weeks ago. Yeah. Yep. So that mm -hmm. project ended the first week of April. Okay. Um, and we are working on with Leah and and Todd to launch their program and some other campaigns mm. that'll be launching mm -hmm. at the same time and then just following. So okay. now we're up and running, full blast. Sounds good. And, you know, it's just amazing to see the diversity of projects that have been submitted to the Already? platform that we're very, very excited about. So mm -hmm. next week, in, in addition to Leah and Todd and Big Sonia, we've got a scientist who's writing a series of children's books mm -hmm. so that she can get children interested in STEM from a very young age. Good. We have um, a domestic violence group that's going to be running a campaign as well. We also have a woman who is an inventor, mm -hmm. a 26 year old inventor who is reinventing the cheese industry and turning it on its wheels, as we say. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very exciting. She launched a project, a product in November that blew out when it hit the shelves and she got press from everybody from the New York Times to Vogue across the board and she's doing a new extension project product um, to add to her line and so we're very happy to be partnering with her on that it's a diverse group of projects to yeah. say the least and right? there's many more that are right. are are waiting to launch but um, we're not talking about those yet because they're right. not going to be live for for no, another couple of weeks got it great well if you have a project and you've heard the rather diverse group of, of descriptions of, of these different uh, projects, uh, well wor worthwhile projects, you can look these guys up on, uh, women, I guess, Google Women You Should Fund. Uh, what, what, what are the best ways to reach? Um, you could visit womenyoushouldfund.com. Mm -hmm. um, you can email us at support at womenyoushouldfund.com. And we'd be happy to talk to anybody about any projects that they're thinking about doing. Great. And we'll, we'll just stay in touch then. And you know, we'll look forward to seeing the success, I'm sure, of uh, the Big Sonia uh, uh, campaign. Yes, we're very excited about it. I'm sure. After Harriet Tubman and Sonia Warshawski, right? That's her name, right? She... Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. The Big Shoes. Big Shoes now. Yes, yeah, uh, some fantastic, amazing <laughs> women who've <laughs> yeah. made history in their own ways. It's, Absolutely. it's an incredible thing for us to be a part of. And we're going to be speaking with uh, the filmmakers momentarily. We're going to be speaking with the filmmakers behind the film, Big Sonia, Todd Soliday, and, uh, and, and Leah Warshawski. So looking forward to that. Uh, thank you both very much, Jennifer thank and you. Cynthia. Thank you, Adam. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, everybody. Uh, please do subscribe to Filmax Radio on iTunes. Leave a star rating. Leave a comment for us. Uh, also, if you could, follow us on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash filmwaxradio. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at filmwaxradio. We're on YouTube. There's a channel of YouTube. You can catch all of our shows. We're also on YouTube, let alone iTunes and Stitcher. And uh, soon we'll be getting the shows on SoundCloud and Spotify and other places as well. Thank you to everybody who's been on this episode. Thank you to uh, the folks at Magic Drop. And uh, thank you to everybody at Showbriz Studios. And thank you also to my partners at Rooftop Films. Go check out rooftopfilms.com for the full lineup of films coming up this spring and summer. I will be going to as many of those screenings as possible. But in the meantime, take care of yourself and the ones you love.
Until next time, everybody, take care.